I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Rob Linefelter and I'm the current president of the Physician Hospitals of America. I'm the CEO of the Lincoln Surgical Hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, welcome to our uh, seminar today on ESOPs. And before we get started, just a few housekeeping things uh, to uh, get us going and a couple of reminders. Uh, just want to let you know that we have opened up the Executive Summit uh, for registration. That is October 3rd through the 5th. Uh, you can go to the website, to the PHA website, to get more information on that. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, getting back together in person and having a great meeting. Uh, the topic of ESOPs has been on our radar for, free, uh, for the last few years, uh, especially a lot of all the things that are happening in, in, in recruiting and trying to retain employees. And, and we also have a little angle here that we want to look through in terms of potential uh, ways that we can look at working with Section 6001 of the Affordable Care Act. So we're anxious to see about that. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our panel of guests today um, that uh, will include, uh, I'm going to get my other sheet here. Um, will be presented today by uh, Stroud, Stroudwater AE. Uh, and Stroudwater AE is a partnership between Stroudwater Associates and Applied Economics, a leading hospital and physician venture consulting group, and a leading financial advisory firm specializing in business valuation and ESOP advisory. These groups have worked together for decades on hundreds of physician business transactions and realized it was time they came together to make ESOPs and options for these scenarios. By combining their expertise, they are able to launch the nation's most experienced ESOP advisory for healthcare businesses and physician-owned organizations. So we'll have our presenters today will be uh, Dave uh, Burdett. He's the Director of Applied Economics and Specialist in ESOP Analysis and Formation. He is a member of the ESOP Association Fiduciary Committee. Uh, next will be Eric Kramer, is a Managing Director of Applied Economics, working with clients on valuation, M&As, capital, ra capital uh, raising, and fund financial restructuring. Uh, Opal Greenway is a Principal and Physician Business Group Practice Leader at Stroudwater Associates. She focuses on strategy, uh, strategic needs, including development, M&A, capital planning and regulatory compliance. And finally, we'll have Jeff Summer is the Managing Director of Stroudwater, focusing on the, on the nexus of strategy, capital planning, affiliations and operational performance. Uh, so with that introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Opal and she can uh, uh, lead us off. So thank you. Thank you, Rob, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us in our webinar today. Um, let's talk about really the reason why we're all here, is that there are significant issues and problems that have been plaguing physician-owned hospitals for years. It's not, some of this stuff is not new, but what has been going on in recent years, particularly the pandemic, has everybody reevaluating how have these problems come about and what should we do about them? Realistically, physician-owned hospitals have some unique situations that create problems that are applicable to them that others don't have at quite the same extent. We have significant regulations that have hampered our ability to grow and are actually threatening the sustainability of these hospitals. A lot of these organizations are thinking, what's next for me? You know, How do I actually tackle population health? How do I right size? How can I do all of this underneath you know, the fact that I have to deal with Stark and the section 6001 of the Affordable Care Act? You know, how am I gonna go about actually moving forward in the future? Does that mean a transaction for me? And does that kind of transaction mean my only options are might be a larger system or one of the for profits? And you know, that, does that coincide with the vision that I originally had for this physician-owned hospital? And a lot of our clients are saying, you know, maybe it doesn't. So how, how can I address that? On top of that, taxes are going up. Um, realistically, they're getting higher. No circumstance have we looked at or scenario do we see taxes actually decreasing. And the taxes that are hitting physician-owned hospitals are you know, not just at the hospital entity, but for those owners themselves that might be putting you in a personal financial crunch. On top of that, everybody is experiencing issues with recruiting the top talent. 
We're going to, whether you're a physician owned hospital, a, um, a for profit hospital, private equity backed, people are understanding that being able to get new providers into a market is increasingly difficult. COVID has exacerbated that. Even before COVID, we knew we were going to have a shortage of both physicians, advanced practice providers, and other types of clinical uh, support staff in all of our organizations. And COVID has exacerbated this extensively. So organizations are thinking, how do I be able to continue to invest in my top talent? How do I keep them engaged when they're probably at their highest levels of disengagement that they've experienced in years. We heard that over 68% of providers right now are experiencing some level of burnout, which is record rates for us. And so if that, if the ways that we go about it, as far as recruiting this talent, we also have to think about it from a retention standpoint of keeping who we have. Nobody has the cash on hand right now to say, okay, I'll just replace them with another physician. And then the physician-owned hospital, we have unique circumstances that allow us to actually recruit top talent in a way that is different from others, right? We can actually address the engagement and the burnout issue in a way that other organizations can't. So if we have specific problems for physician-owned hospitals, historically, how we've gone about solving those problems, because some of these are not new, has been really very piecemeal. We've taken an a la carte approach to it. You said, how can we deal with, you know, the regulatory or barriers? And it's oftentimes a one, you know, one piece at a time. It might be partnering with one of the for profits or, you know, another regional system for 50% ownership to provide a cash inflow into the organization and allow for some potential expansion. But we still have the parts that are um, the regulatory barriers that do exist. You know, we might have had some sort of cash infusion with underneath the CARES Act that, hey, with taxes going up, okay, well, at least we're still financially sustainable. We try to recruit and retain to say, how is our physician-owned hospital, you know, different and what might be unique about us to actually try to incentivize providers to come to us. But again, those have been very piecemeal and a la carte. One of the things that we've come together to really pay attention to is that the ESOP provides actually a very creative and a unique solution where we can tackle all of these problems under one umbrella. We can actually have a strategy that is at our fingertips that instead of dealing with it, putting out fires one at a time and dealing with the headache, we can actually say, all right, actually an ESOP here might allow us to have an expansion of our facilities, might actually allow us to deal with recruiting physicians and have a sustainable path going forward of succession planning. How do I replace my phys current physician owners with new owners that are in the same overall aligned vision that I had when I started this kind of organization. And then of course, everybody appreciates anything that can help me slash my taxes. We're under an ESOP because if it's a 100% owned ESOP, you ex are exempt from some of the taxes that you guys have been paying. Well, what would I do with that influx of cash flow? Could I use it to be able to afford recruiting and retaining and incentivizing providers? What other things can I actually use that kind of cash to invest in some of the population health initiatives that I've had to put on the back burner while dealing with the kinds of problems that have happened with COVID or the structures that end up within fee for service. So thinking about it as an ESOP actually tackling all of these allows us a gateway to actually having a strategy that moves the physician owned hospital forward in a unique way that frankly, people haven't been taking advantage of to date. So that being said, I'm going to let my colleague David here talk to you guys a little bit more detail about exactly what is an ESOP and how it addresses these issues. Thank you, Opal. Uh, and this is David. And uh, we're here to talk about what an ESOP really is, our Employee Stock Ownership Plan, or ESOP for short. Uh, an ESOP is a qualified em employee retirement plan uh, under the Internal Revenue Code that's overseen by uh, ERISA. At its core, ESOPs are really three main things. Uh, first, it's an ownership transition tool. So it takes uh, ownership from its current levels and transitions it ownership to the employee base uh, of, a, of an organization. Uh, what's nice about that is the physician owners can choose, you know, any, any type of structure that it's very flexible. So they can choose to sell all of their stock or, or some. So ESOPs can own from zero up to 100% of a company. Uh, what's also unique is that the ESOP trust itself is you know, one single shareholder and it's overseen by an ESOP trustee. And we'll talk more about those entities in, in, a, in a few slides. Uh, the other thing an ESOP is, uh, 
it's an employee benefit retirement plan. It's a qualified plan under the code. It, it allows for tax deferred growth, uh, very similar to like a 401k, right? You get uh, uh, equity accumulation uh, over time in that account and it grows tax deferred. The third thing is, uh, real quick, um, the final thing is it's a tax efficient leverage buyout. So, uh, you know, that really kind of goes along with feature number one is that it, it's a way to transition ownership from current owners to the broad based em employees. As with anything in life, uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, we believe there are the pros far outweigh any of the ESOP cons. Uh, the biggest pros in our view for an ESOP are their structural flexibility. Uh, it's an internal uh, transaction. Uh, it's not an external sale. It's not like selling to a private equity group or other you know, hospital system or what have you. It's you know an internal transaction. Uh, so it's highly customizable, highly controlled. Uh, and it can be very, very flexible depending on the goals of the owners and the employee base. Uh, another great thing is that it keeps uh, uh, everything uh, private. So there, uh, everything, uh, there's no outside information getting leaked out, any competitors or anything like that. So it's all an internal transaction. It can get you, uh, as Opal mentioned a moment ago, ex exemptions from the restrictive regulations that are out there and actually permit the hospital systems to grow. Uh, another big benefit that I think is nice about ESOPs is that, uh, and we'll talk more about this here in a moment, but the physicians can continue just as they normally uh, have been. They can continue to, uh, to practice medicine. They can be involved in the business, or if they want to retire, this is a great way for them to, to do that as well. So they can do it on their terms, which is something that they probably wouldn't get if they were going to sell to another party. Cons, uh, there's no strategic pricing. So like with any industry or any company, rather, when you uh, sell to a strategic uh, um, a buyer, they can usually pay, uh, pay up for you because they can trim cost either through layoffs or changing the facilities or other, uh, other massive uh, cost cuts. Uh, that doesn't happen here with, with, with an ESOP. Uh, the repurchase obligation, the, the company is required to buy back the shares of the party employees. Uh, you know, that is a cost going forward. Uh, but in our view, that doesn't really, you know, change what the current repurchase obligation is anyway in most situations for physician and hospitals. And finally, uh, there is Department of Labor oversight. They are, it is regulated by uh the Employee Retirement Income Security Act and the Department of Labor. So when we think about, you know, what we are trying to accomplish from, you know, from an ESOP and why it's attractive, if I think specifically having worked um, with physician-owned organizations for the majority of my career, I think about trying to put on my physician hat. If I'm an owner, what are the things that are going to be really attractive to me, right? Oftentimes, depending on where I'm in my career, I might be looking for some potential liquidity to a transaction, which an ESOP actually provides me, you know, which, okay, there are other different options out there that also provide that kind of liquidity. If I do a sale to another organization, you know, can I get some liquidity and go ahead and fund my retirement that way, whether it's private equity, a for-profit or some one of those. Those obviously come with significant strings attached to it. If I were going to go that route, I have to deal with clawbacks, I have to deal with potential earnouts. So that kind of liquidity is at a different kind of risk than it would be underneath an ESOP structure where I know the organization that I'm actually doing the transaction with. It's my own organization. It's completely internal. So my control and my say in that liquidity gives me a lot more confidence in that kind of transaction. On top of that, I've actually optimized that liquidity by having at, it's funded with after tax tax uh, cash flow. So not hitting the having the burden of taxes, which are currently highly variable, and we don't know what's going to happen with any of them other than the fact that they're going to be higher and what's going to happen from a capital gains perspective, right? I know that my liquidity is actually in a more protected state from that standpoint. If I am nearing that kind of retirement, you know, I get that liquidity, but I also have the ability to now have the new generation of physician owners come in that I currently can't because of the 6001 rule, right? I can have and engage with entrepreneurial succession planning physicians who want to partake in that equity, which historically I've just had to employ them and hopefully, you know, really to provide maybe some sort of mentorship to them and get them engaged in the organization. But 
it's hard to incorporate them into the strategic planning and the vision of the organization and create that kind of buy-in when they can't sit alongside me and actually participate in that equity and the upside of the organization, right? We can see that different level of engagement for a physician that has a say at the table and is executing a vision that they're a part of, as opposed to something that's being more directive, right, from a top-down management standpoint. And that's where it actually helps me create that strategic and economic alignment is one of the things that has been one of the key aspects of a physician-owned hospital that's truly unique is the fact that we have physicians and the management team, the holding company and employees, we're all rowing in the same boat. We understand how we're incentivized and we know why we went, you know, for, from that perspective, if you're a clinician, you know why you went into medical school. You have a vision for how you want patients to be treated. It's not something that just sits in, okay, here's what the government says, how I need to treat patients. It's how do I, as a clinician, think what this is what's best for my community. And the fact that now as an owner, that's actually how I'm also incentivized. And under an ESOP, now my all of my employees are actually incentivized in that same structure. Now we can have a cohesive vision that everybody can move the organization forward in. And we're actually able to do better care for our patients to be able to say, okay, everything is aligned, right? Our, our payment, we have a say in you know, who we're working with from a payer strategy, how we get paid, all of that now fits in with what our original vision was for patient care. And taking that same equation and looking at it from the hospital perspective or the holding company perspective, the advantages of an ESOP, you're creating a, a, a much more tax efficient structure um, for the corporate entity. It's going to reduce the, the tax burden going forward. That has very real implications to the available cash flow to pay physician owners uh, and fund and reinvest growth and, and to pay down debt from the ESOP transaction. Um, so very meaningful. Um, and it allows you to have greater uh, confidence and an option that allows the hospital to remain independent. You don't necessarily have to do a private equity backed um, transaction or sell to a strategic partner or health system, if you will. Um, the, the important thing to note here on that independence strategy is um, one of the key questions with whether it's a physician-owned ASC, physician-owned imaging center, or physician-owned hospital is the question of succession planning. And an ESOP is a way for um, the, the ownership group to realize some liquidity and a fair market value transaction for ownership for those members of ownership that are not looking to, uh, as this is a retirement um, uh, event, um, they can continue on. And we'll discuss that a little bit later in the presentation and have some meaningful upside, uh, if you will, going forward. But that combination and that balance provides a longevity and a succession planning uh, approach that, that can allow the physician-owned hospital to remain independent um, uh, going forward. For management team um, and employees, um, again, this creates that longer-term alignment that uh, so many of us seek both as employers, but uh, certainly uh, perhaps earlier in our careers uh, when we were employees or starting out might have been um, uh, meaningful from an employee perspective personally. But this, this idea of creating long-term strategic alignment of incentives um, and a platform where your, your trusted management and leadership can substantially grow the hospital and participate in that is, is a significant factor. Thanks, Jeff. So you've heard a little bit about the problems uh, and the solutions that the ESOP addresses. How does it work? Um, and I think we've made reference to the fact that, you know, it's, it's no different than any other corporate transaction. And there's really these three circles over to the right. There's really just two parties, the leaders, that's you, the owners, we, we call you the sellers in this case, because you would be selling your stock to, uh, to the other party. And so you're sitting on one side of the table and on the other side of the table is the trustee who represents the buyers uh, who are the, the employees of the company. Uh, so from that end of it, it is a corporate transaction that is negotiated over, over some period of time, typically a, 
a, a six to eight month process, start to finish. Um, really, probably somewhat quicker than the traditional corporate M&A transaction. Uh, again, because the parties are all friendly uh, insofar as, uh, you know, any one of them can sort of uh, communicate on a, on a different level than a, than a, than a third party would. Uh, and so within that, Stradwater AE, our combined team, our role is to, to really package that up and put everything together so that you don't have to uh, and take it to the ESOP trustee, the other side. Some of the services we provide in quarterbacking the deal, <clears throat> if you will, are uh, you know, working to structure it properly so that all your, your needs are, are met. And you know, David made reference earlier to the flexibility of the ESOP. That's, that's by far one of the most attractive um, elements here is that if you've seen one, you've seen one. There are just thousands of different ways to make these work for you and your company. So that's, that's the benefit of hiring an expert that someone that does it all, all day, every day, they know all the different tricks and nuances and structures. Um, and so we will be involved heavily for probably two to three months, educating you uh, as to your different options and, and performing the feasibility work to understand what the, the limitations and constraints might be. Uh, and then uh, following, you know, that intensive sort of education and feasibility process over a probably 60 to 90 day period, uh, then we take that deal, we package it up and we take it over across the table to a, a, probably an institutional trustee uh, and a team of, of lawyers that represent them and the negotiations proceed uh, on a friendly, hospitable basis from there. Uh, there is some, some iterative work that goes into that, but over the course of the next three or four months, uh, the, the transaction should close with a much higher rate of closure and, and much lower risk of non-closure than any type of traditional M&A transaction. Thank you, Eric. So in that vein about how the ESOP actually is implemented, I want to kind of show you, you know, how it could look. Uh, you know, so these next two slides show you on a, from a high 50,000 foot level basis, you know, kind of the flow of funds and where, where's money going uh, and what are the moving parts. Uh, this can be way more complicated uh, depending on the individual facts and circumstances. You can have drop down LLCs and holding companies and uh, management organizations, and you can have a lot more hexagons on this page, a lot more arrows and things. But uh, to keep it simple, at the end of the day, this is pretty much how things kind of settle. Uh, you know, so the first thing is typically what we uh, what we assume here is that an outside lender or bank will loan uh, the hospital or holding company, uh, you know, some funds, uh, who in turn gives that to the uh, physician owners down there in the, in the bottom left-hand side there. Uh, so you can kind of see the, the money flows from the bank to the company, and that goes to the physician owner's pocket. And you'll see that under the cash and notes and warrants. So a little bit of uh, explanation there. Uh, typically what we see in most ESOP closings is that at some point the uh, owners are going to receive some level of cash at closing. Uh, and then they're going to take back uh, a seller note uh, for the balance uh, of the transaction price. Uh, those notes typically will have a warrant position attached to them uh, to enhance the return. And we'll get more to that, those details in a moment. Uh, but the warrant is simply a uh, financial instrument that gives the warrant holder a, uh, an interest in the company uh, at some future date. So it's like getting a second bite at an apple, if you will, and it, it enhances the owner's return. Uh, so those, those things right there, the bank loan and the seller note are what we refer to as any external loans. Those were loans where uh, the hospital ho or holding company will actually stroke a check and money leaves the door. What's unique, though, in the ESOP world is that there's also this thing called an internal loan, also known as an inside loan. Uh, and that is just between uh, the hospital and the ESOP trust itself. And that's an internal loan because money doesn't really leave the door. Uh, and you'll see that here on the, on the next page, how money flows over time. So what, oh, there you go. Um, so what happens is, is if you look up at the top right hand of the screen there, uh, money flows over time. 
the holding company or hospital is going to repay any outside lender, any outside bankers, and the seller's uh, uh, notes uh, over time. So that loan gets repaid. So that's the external loans again. Cash is leaving the door. The internal loan, though, money doesn't really uh, leave, leave the house, as I call it. So what happens is, is that the uh, hospital holding company will make a contribution to the ESOP trust, but the ESOP trust immediately gives that fun, those funds right back to the company. So there is no cash flow impact. There's uh, journal entries and accounting I impacts, but from a cash perspective, that doesn't do anything um, from a cash flow perspective. But what that mechanism does is that, that uh, uh, ESOP contribution and, and uh, internal loan repayment back to the hospital holding company, that allocates stock there at the bottom. You'll see that stock allocation. That is the mechanism that releases shares to the employees and physicians over time per the uh, internal loan documents between the trust and the, and the hospital. And that's where the employees uh, and physicians benefit and they receive share allocations uh, over time. So, um, um, and thank you, David, for the expl explanation on the prior slides. I think it's important uh, to be able to answer if, if I'm a uh, owner of a physician-owned hospital, what, what does this mean for me if we were to enter into an ESOP transaction? And, and the first um, item that's, that's notable is the ESOP transaction occurs at fair market value. So my ownership stake transacts at fair market value. Um, which is um, obviously a significant benefit, and it's done in, um, uh, in a tax-efficient way because it's capital gains. Um, at the time of transaction, typically 10 to 20 percent of the fair market, fair market value consideration is paid in cash to the selling uh, owners. Uh, the rest would be retained in the form of a note uh, to seller in lieu for their ownership stake um, in in the entity. So uh, again, there's a there's a, a financial a cash uh, component to that and a subordinated note uh, component of that. But it does provide those owners that are looking for a retirement associated liquidity liquidity vehicle uh, the opportunity to do so in a tax efficient way at fair market value. For the remainder of the owners who may have longer in their careers, no desire to retire, um, either at the time of transaction or perhaps within a year or two of transaction, there's an important opportunity for them to get, in addition to the fair market value consideration for their ownership stake at the time of the transaction, to build an equity position um, or the equivalent of an equity position, I should say, um, but significant uh, wealth and value in the ESOP as it increases in value post-transaction. So that typically occurs via a couple of mechanisms. One is the pay down of debt uh, at the time of transaction, both the external bank financing to provide the liquidity, if that's the source of liquidity for the selling uh, owners, and also the shareholder notes. As those are paid down, all other things being equal, the value of the ESOP will increase post-transaction. Additionally, if there's an increase in, in operating cash flow, and again, the tax uh, efficient nature of an ESOP is very helpful in this regard in terms of paying down debt and also building um, cash reserves uh, on the balance sheet. Those also factor into the value uh, entity, but as does enhanced cash flow. So that ability to get, I think David used the term, a second bite at the apple is really important for folks that are not looking to retire, uh, but looking to continue their careers and continue to build uh, wealth and value as part of the ESOP going forward. And that is true yeah. both for owners, um, but also for employees and management as well. Hey, Jeff, can you hear me? Yes. Curious, in, in your case, um, as you pay down your seller notes, how has your accountant treated the repayment of the principal? It's my understanding that that's typically a tax deductible expense. The principal uh, it is a tax deductible expense at the, at the corporate level. Um, and obviously, if, if, as the recipient of that, um, if I'm talking about shareholder notes, that's uh, a capital gain uh, item. 
um, for me as a, as a recipient. So yes, those, the, the debt service that was incurred at the time of the transaction um, is part of the operating expense, if you will, of the organization going forward. But again, remember that ESOP is also a, a very tax advantage, tax efficient entity and faces a, very, a, a much reduced uh, corporate tax burden at the federal and frequently at the state level as well. Right, and I, we probably don't have a lot of accountants on the line here, but traditionally only interest is a tax deductible expense for the corporation. So the ability for an ESOP to deduct the principal component of that debt as a business expense is highly beneficial from a tax flow perspective. So a little bit more detail on, on the seller financing, uh, as we uh, just discussed in, in most ESOP transactions, especially ones that are 100% uh, out of the gate transaction where the physician owners sell all of their stock to the ESOP directly or indirectly, they take back you know, seller notes in order to effectuate the transaction. And that's exactly what it sounds. The, the sellers, the physician owners uh, act as the lender uh, or as the banker, if you will, and they receive a note in exchange for their shares. Uh, the seller notes uh, have a lot of advantages. Uh, but as I said earlier, anything in life, pretty much you can say there's advantages and disadvantages. So we want to, you know, put those out there for your consideration. Um, what's really uh, advantageous for seller notes is, again, their flexibility. Uh, given that the uh, physician owners act as the lenders, you can you have a, a significant amount of leeway on how you structure uh, the timing uh, of the notes, its terms. Uh, you know, they can usually, they usually come with uh, board seat rights and things of that nature uh, as well. So they're highly flexible and highly customizable. Uh, in the cases where the uh, uh, business owners and the physician owners want to just finance the entire transaction, uh, which uh, in my experience, uh, uh, probably about 50% of the time, uh, business owners like to do uh, for a number of reasons, uh, chief among which is that the transaction lead time is significantly reduced. There are fewer parties to the transaction. There's no outside lender uh, uh, to, uh, to run their own diligence and, and so forth. Uh, so, and it lowers transaction costs because you're not paying the, those friction costs. Uh, typically, what we see is that it's a uh, fixed income component, uh, you know, a fixed or variable interest rate on those notes uh, that mirror market level returns. Uh, as uh, Eric and Jeff were mentioning, that they can have favorable tax treatment, long term capital gain on the return of principal. And, they, and we'll see on the next slide here in just a moment, uh, there's some very unique and powerful estate and gift, uh, gift tax planning opportunities as well. Uh, the really only disadvantages of the seller note would be uh, no full liquidity at close, which likely with, the, with current ownership structure as it is, that's probably not going to uh, um, be realized anyway. Uh, and the other disadvantage would be if you really wanted to uh, completely cash out your chips and completely you know, retire, uh, step away from the business entirely, uh, you know, you're still going to be uh, remain tied to the business and its uh, future successes, uh, you know, if a full exit is desired. And David, just on that point, um, I think it's worth emphasizing, and Opal can speak to this as well, that, you know, most of the acquisitions we're seeing of physician-owned enterprises, whether those are ASCs or practices, and whether by PE groups or other folks, there typically is an earnout provision or clawback provision. So um, I'm not aware of folks getting 100% liquidity at, at transaction, um, given, given the um, um, requirements that often are structured as part of the transaction. So I think your point's a, a really valid one. You know, I'm going to jump in here too, though, and say a lot of times the notes are paid off a lot earlier than anticipated due to the free cash flow. So a lot of sellers that cash out and think, wow, I've got to be tied to this business for seven years uh, are pleasantly surprised to find out their notes get, get either paid off early due to the improved cash flows of the company or within two or three years get refinanced by bank financing and they get taken out. Yep, those are very good points, uh, Jeff and Eric. Well, the, the thing that, you know, that Jeff just brought up with regards to the clawbacks and the earnouts, I mean, that is one of the things that, frankly, I think it's become, um, you know, common knowledge within um, transactions for physician-owned entities is if you want the largest paycheck up front, 
you go private equity. But then as people actually live the realities of those deals, the earnouts and the clawbacks actually keep you very tethered to the organization that if you actually did a present market, a, a present value of that paycheck that you get from private equity, that it's actually not as high as, you know, the initial um, purchase price that, you know, that people flash across, you know, the, the LOI or something of that nature. So being able to understand that, that present value of, hey, how much, what do I have to do to actually earn this purchase price is significant on an ESOP. And I mean, I'll just speak to our own transaction, Jeff, though, because our company is an ESOP right now, is the amount of involvement for those that are going to go ahead and retire and want to have their notes. When I say that, when we say that you're tied to the company, it doesn't, it's very different than an earnout or a clawback provision where you need to stay involved in the company at the, frankly, at the level that you were historically to be able to get that liquidity. You can fully retire. It's just a matter of there's a risk of, hey, it's a matter, do I have an established organization that I'm going to make sure that the management and the trustees and the people that are still in charge keep the organization on a really strong, healthy footing versus the earnout or that we see with any sort of private equity transaction. And oftentimes the golden handcuffs that come with non-private equity transactions, but basically to an outside seller are significant enough that if you don't stay in the capacity and performing at the capacity that you were historically, you don't get that full bite at the apple. You don't get that full purchase price to what you were originally expected, which is very different from what it is on an ESOP as to the options that are available to you. Yeah, we've, we've sold a number of practices where they get tied up under seven year non-competes and six to seven year employment agreements. So they're, they definitely get tied in in other ways beyond earnouts and clawbacks. This slide is this. Um, this is me. The final thing I'll mention about the uh, some of the attributes of seller financing is what I mentioned a, a moment ago, that the two big key takeaways for me is that you get a second bite of the apples we discussed is that you, you have a future, uh, um, you know, equity or equity like interest down the road, uh, which can be uh, quite uh, profitable. Uh, what's interesting is uh, the, uh, you know, a lot of times we see uh, uh, owners who uh, take back uh, seller financing with warrants will immediately gift warrants post transaction due to the leverage uh, on the company. The equity value is depressed, but they gift their warrants to their children, to their favorite charities, or, or what have you, and that's at a low value. And then as transaction debts repay, you know the value has a turbocharged return, as you kind of see there in the uh, warrant value over time chart and the warrant value trajectory. So it can be a very powerful. Uh, gift and estate planning opportunity. All right, so, you know, this is fascinating to me. This is the third way that, that um, equity wealth can be transferred to either the sellers or the employees. We talked a lot about recruiting and retaining. ESOPs are incredibly flexible in that regard. The the management incentive plans that can be put together uh, can, can create an additional way to compensate your senior level execs uh, and managers or anyone for that matter, but they're typically reserved for, for senior level officers. And it's a, it's a fantastic recruiting tool. Uh, so let's count the ways. We've already, we've already determined that in an ESOP, you're going to get contributions made to your account just for being an employee. And, and, you know, David made a reference earlier to 401k. The difference in, in that is that the 401k is a, a defined contribution plan. An ESOP's more like a defined benefit plan. You get allocated shares to your account and you don't contribute anything. Nothing comes out of your paycheck. Nothing comes out of your employee's paycheck. Just allocations are made based on your, your time of service, typically. Secondarily, he just talked about the warrants that are attached to the seller notes, so the seller can be uh, receive equity in the in the company down the road. And now here we are on slide 17, talking about additional way to convey equity to key employees. Uh, SARS are the are the nomenclature we use, but it's no different than a stock option or very similar. Uh, stock options are used all the time for sexy high growth tech companies, and this is a, a very similar analogy. 
uh, and it's a way to, um, you know, again, convey additional growth and motivate uh, employees to, to push for that growth. Uh, and that's why it's typically put in the hands of, of, of executives. And so if, as you go down the list here, you see that, you know, they're typically, uh, they're typically time vested, in my opinion. I think we see more of that than performance based. It's a lot easier to understand. It may not be as effective as motivationally, but it's still, it's still what a lot of folks uh, sort of anticipate. Um, and ultimately, like a stock option, when it's exercised, you get the value of whatever the, the stock the strike price was uh, uh, versus what the market price is at the time of exercise. And so if these are granted uh, at the initial formation of the ESOP, they have a very low pennies per share equity value because of the way the deal is so highly leveraged at, at, at the initial formation. So the, the management team that, that installs the ESOP is going to have a very low exercise price, strike price. And as the value of the company grows, uh, they're going to get all that appreciation, just as you would with a stock option. So those last two bullets just show how the equity value gets magnified. Uh, back to my slide real quick. <laughs> Uh, as the debt, remember this is a leveraged deal. So as the debt get paid, gets paid down, the equity uh, value expands exponentially. And secondarily, just through the organic growth of the company, the equity should in, increase as well. So those are, uh, those are two ways to transfer that uh, wealth. So one of the things that people say, you know, want to think about with regards to, okay, the, this is SARS, how, how does my increase... And people are wondering, okay, as a physician, I've how I have contributed versus maybe you know an MA or an RN or something ha has contributed. Oftentimes, when we can look at this allocation of stock, um, you know, over time, it is based off of what they've been contributing. You have the ability to actually set that, you know, based on how people are contributing to the organization. You have a significant amount of flexibility on the ESOP side specifically. It's actually tied to those total wages and it's proportionate. So you think about it, your compensation as a physician is significantly different than what a, maybe an LPN is making. And so that being tied to those W-2 wages, yes, it allows us, you know, historically maybe as a physician owned hospital, all the ownership was held by some physicians within the organization that originally founded it. But being able to actually incentivize everybody in the organization, all employees, on this portion of it, right, the ESOP side means everybody's moving towards that overall vision and that they can have kind of benefit, they can benefit from it. Our outsized benefits are still tied to our physician leaders, to those physicians who are significantly contributing to the organization. But the fact that you can actually, we think about the nursing shortages that we have right now, their ability to actually create that creates a stickiness and a retention for them to continue to participate since they have upside as well in being able to do that. Um, and as a reminder, I've just seen that we've had some people come in as far as um, with questions that you can use the Q&A portion of on, on Zoom to be able to ask questions as we're going along. So um, I, I just want to share a little bit on this life as an ESOP company. As, as has been mentioned, Stradwater is an ESOP. We've been an ESOP for about three and a half years. And it's important. We can certainly validate this. Hospital, the operations of the entity remain unchanged. Uh, management continues to run the organization. Just as you previously had a board, you continue to have a board that provides oversight of management in their role. In addition to that board, there is a trustee. Uh, or in our case, a board of trustees can be more than one individual. And those folks have a fiduciary responsibility to the ESOP trust, the ESOP plan itself and the participants. So there is an additional layer of governance. That layer of governance does not get involved in the day-to-day, month-to-month work of management or even the board of directors. It is an extra layer of, of governance and fiduciary accountability on behalf of the ESOP trust. The trust and trustees do work in concert with the board on a number of issues, both in terms of potentially appointing outside directors to the board uh, or an outside trustee. The board typically uh, appoints uh, trustees. Um, and in turn, if the ESOP owns a majority uh, portion of, 
of the um, entity, um, the ESOP trustees will often attend uh, board meetings, et cetera. So from our experience, what I will tell you is it's performed as we would have liked in terms of creating that long-term alignment uh, and an ownership culture within our firm, doing so in a much more tax efficient way than our prior structure, which had a widely disseminated stock structure, but was immensely tax inefficient. Um, cost to operate for us is actually less than about than 35K, but I think that's a good estimate, including an annual valuation, including the annual costs of uh, ESOP council, uh, et cetera. So about $35,000 a year. This is our last slide before we start taking uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so moving forward, you know, so how do you actually implement the ESOP? Uh, we strongly recommend that uh, that we do perform what's called an ESOP feasibility study. And that is uh, a study that we do uh, to uh, arm the physicians and, and the company with the information they need to determine whether or not to proceed with actually doing an ESOP transaction. We look at a number of different features. Uh, obviously, valuation is at the heart of it. Uh, what is the value of the hospital? What will the employee benefit levels look like post-transaction? What kind of management equity incentives will there be, if any? Uh, we look at uh, the leverage multiples and you know where cash flow goes over time and what that means to all the constituents, especially the physician owners, we look at their uh, how the transaction affects them on a tax affected cash flow basis uh, from the transaction and the financing of the sale with the goal being that we would like to increase the physician owners after tax net cash flow uh, post transaction is, is the goal. So one last thing is, of course, you know, Physicians are busy seeing patients that want, they do, the question is how much time is this going to take for me to do? And realistically, you know, given as a transaction off with a physician owned hospital, there is a significant team that's working on it here, right? We talked about our role with Stroudwater AE, there's a trustee team and you have your corporate team. So there's all these different moving parts. And frankly, the way that works is it helps minimize how much time physician owners actually have to be directly involved, pulling you away from patient care is definitely one of those things that we avoid. And so really as a physician owner, when you think about what is my role in it, it's understanding the full scope of you know, what we're doing, participating in the education, giving your input and feedback as to where you are from an alignment standpoint of like how is, what unique features because of the flexibility with ESOPs, what features do I wanna put in it to make sure it still achieves the vision that was originally um, done for the organization or where the organization wants to go. But luckily you have count, you know, corporate counsel, you have tax advisors, you have, you know, a team such as ourselves and also the ESOP trustee team that are taking a lot of it um, on, on as far as getting this forward, as opposed to frankly, when we've looked at this from a single, like a solo practitioner with their kind of organization, they don't have uh, so many of these different pieces in place that make it as attractive to them because, you know, it, it is going to be time consuming if you don't have specific and adequate teams in place. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to you, Rob, and, you know, let's go ahead and have some Q&A as far as what questions that people have. Uh, one of the questions that came to me in the Q&A, again, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to the Q&A board, is uh, what is one thing that you learned that you would have done differently in setting up your uh, ESOP at, at Stroudwater? Um, Rob, I, uh, I would say probably a couple of things. Um, the first would have been, I, I wish we'd done it sooner. Um, it, it, an ESOP is really a powerful tool for people that have longevity. So there's the benefit of doing the transaction and transacting at fair market value. Significant benefit to the existing owners at the time we did it. But the second bite at the apple, as David describes it, um, really benefits from a longevity um, and creating that long-term uh, value. And I wish we'd done it earlier so I could have been younger to get a bigger bite at that apple, if you will, post-transaction. Um, the second thing I would just say is you know, we, we, I think our ESOP was very durable. We had a couple of uh, senior members of the firm that didn't behave in a way we'd envisioned. Um, that sometimes happens. It was very durable um, throughout that process. Um, I think in hindsight, there's a few things I wish we had, 
you know, plan for the worst and hope for the best. I, I think that experience was, was very helpful um, for us as, in terms of how we think about the ESOP, our own going forward and have tweaked some of the provisions, but also in terms of how we advise clients. Uh, another question is what's, what is the range of sale in terms of percentages that you see to the ESOP? I mean, is it, you see a lot of them that go 50%, 100%, 10%, what, what is kind of the range that you see of that, that sale? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, this is David, I'll take that one. Uh, more often than not, I see 100% uh, because companies and uh, business owners, they, they want to latch on to that tax benefit because being, as we said earlier, 100% S-Corp owned ESOP is super powerful. You're exempt from all federal taxes. So out of the gate, your, your returns should be over time at least equal to that, right? Whatever you're paying in federal taxes. Most states recognize the S-Corp election. There's a few out there that don't, uh, you know, but the ones that do, you could be uh, have a zero state and uh, federal tax liability. Some states, uh, such as you know, California and I believe Louisiana is another example, uh, have franchise taxes, but those are pretty small uh, that uh, are not exempt. But for the most, by and large, exempt from all federal, that's across the board on all, all states. And then most are exempt from, uh, from state and other taxes. So that's why we see 100% being kind of the magic number or the goal. Uh, but also we do see uh, ESOPs get there in stages, sometimes a third, a third, a third, or 40, 60, or, or something along those lines. Another question's come in in regards to if your facility is, is partly owned by a not-for-profit, uh, can, can an ESOP work? So this is Jeff. I, I, what I would say is, first of all, the caveat, we, we need to know more about the existing structure. But what I would tell you is our work in transactions nationally, there's a very well-trod ground with, um, as, as you've experienced in, in that example, with not-for-profit and for-profit ventures doing, doing JVs. So that 50% component that is not owned, that is, that is the physician owned uh, entity could transact 100% of that 50% or some smaller percentage um, in terms of uh, doing an ESOP. The thing to keep an eye on is just understanding you know, scale. If, if the, the cash flow of the 50% portion um, is, is so small or is smaller, the ability or feasibility of doing just a portion of that 50% in an ESOP might erode over time, just because the cash flow might be uh, getting cut into, into smaller slivers. But um, so I, my understanding would be, and I'd, I'd need to know more about the situation, but an ESOP structure could work in that circumstance, uh, certainly, but we'd need to know more about the specifics. Yeah, and one of the things is, I mean, this is definitely, this is a lot more common right, with other types of physician-owned entities, such as an ASC structure. And so to be able to kind of create that succession planning within an ASC that doesn't have some of the regulatory requirements of the physician-owned hospital, like those have done that 100% ESOP structure or a portion of it. Um, so it's definitely still feasible for a physician-owned hospital to have that portion. I think one of the things that you have to think about strategically is okay, do we just transfer this 50% that's the physician-owned section into the hospital? And how do we communicate and have that partnership with the 50% that, that is owned by a community not-for-profit? Because I would say best practice in our experience would be have them at the table with you that they understand what you're doing. They don't necessarily have the same decision rights and they don't have to be a part of it, but making sure that you guys are lockstep with the overall, because what you don't want to do is, oh, by the way, we went through and we became an ESOP and, you know, that, that's now your partner um, rather than having them fully on board because they, I think they needed just as much education as, frankly, the physician owners do in doing that kind of transaction. And we'll finish up with this last question. How does exactly how and why does the ESOP get around some of the moratorium of expansion in section 6001 of the Affordable Care Act. That's a, I mean, that's a good question for the, for the legal team. Um, 
But conceptually, as a retirement plan, it's exempted from all manner of regulations related to Stark and a kickback and other federal regs. So its status as a retirement plan is what exempts it as, as owner, again, uh, from the physician ownership moratorium under the uh, ACA. So you're, bring, you're bringing on new positions and do they have to be employees then? That's a great question. It's on a case by case basis. Uh, some uh, hospitals, uh, as we understand it, through our, our clients and our relationships, that uh, uh, some are employees and, and some are not. Uh, that's that, again, you got to look at the case by case basis. There may or may not need to be some restructuring uh, done in order to get them included. So it's it all just depends, and every case is different. It needs to be analyzed uh, on its own merits. Yeah, and part of that is also depend on whether or not you're in a corporate practice of medicine state. And so what entity actually needs to do the employment versus from an ESOP perspective versus do you have to have a subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary um, or some or, you know, a, a professional practice um, entity. So it is it is a case by case situation, but it, it, it still allows the success and one to apply. Or sorry, the exemption to the success and one to apply. Well, I know there's a lot more questions uh, that we have, but uh, we're out of time. And, and uh, hopefully I know that we're looking at uh, having you guys be at the, uh, at the Executive Summit in October. Hopefully we can make that happen. And uh, we look forward to talking to you then. So Great. thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye.